Welcome to this tutorial on the audiogram. The audiogram is a space where we record our hearing test results. So we're going to find out what, uh, what, what all the components of the audiogram mean and how to interpret and read an audiogram. So let's begin. To, uh, in this tutorial we're going to cover um, uh, the fact that the audiogram is a graph and uh, the properties of sound that we will view on the audiogram. We're going to have a quick look at uh, decibels and frequencies and what they mean or how they're derived. We're going to look at something that's called the speech banana um, and how that relates to a person's hearing loss. We're also going to look at what symbols we use on the audiogram and then we'll look at how to read the audiogram putting all these symbols together. So away we go. Okay. In front of you here is, is uh, one example of an audiogram and the audiogram is a graph where we plot our hearing levels. Um, sometimes it can be referred to as an inverted graph and this means um, that the zero reading, and we can see zero here, is at the top of the graph. In most other graphs you'll see the zero reading at the bottom. Um, so we're kind of looking at, at the audiogram upside down compared to the usual sort of graph that you will see. And what having zero at the top basically means that the closer to the top of the graph the person's results are will indicate the, um, the better their hearing is. So the closer you, the noughts and crosses are to the top of the graph, the better the hearing. Okay, so the audiogram is going to record up uh, the person's hearing and uh, to test hearing we use sound and properties of sound, um, um, the properties of sound that we, we are interpreting are quite important. Now there are two conditions required to make sound, um, basically we need um, to get something vibrating and to move some molecules through an elastic medium. Um, and that elastic medium is generally air. Um, sound can travel um, you know, through water and um, through solid objects but nowhere near as well as it does through air. So what happens is the, the displacement of air molecules from the vibration results in pressure changes and um, if we were to represent them in some way we, we might use a waveform and the waveform will show the magnitude or intensity of the sound and it will also um, how many of these each wave form which has um, compressions and rarefractions uh, makes one whole wave and however many of those waves uh, fall into um, the period of one second will indicate the pitch of the sound. And on the audiogram we denote intensity using or magnitude using decibels and we denote pitch using frequency. Now decibels, so what's a decibel? Well we measure hearing in decibels but what exactly does that mean? Um, well firstly we describe the magnitude of sound as intensity and this is related to how we perceive loudness. Um, it's a perception, so some people will perceive some sounds louder than other people will. The range of intensity of sound is very large. For example, the pressure level of sound that is just barely audible is approximately 20 micropascals. Micropascals are a, un a unit of measure of pressure. And when the pressure level of sound becomes so intense it is painful, that measurement is around 200 million micropascals. So this range of numbers is very hard to handle and so a logarithmic equation was required. And without going into too much detail, the logarithm for sound is the ratio of two power quantities, measured power and reference power. Initially the use of the bell, which is a seldom used unit named in honour of Alexander Graham Bell, um, he invented the telephone, that was investigated and with the logarithmic equations that in large intensity range of 20 pascals to 200 million micropascals, sorry, 20 micropascals to 200 million micropascals. Um, when it was put into a logarithmic equation um, to represent the bell, the, the range became 1 to 14 bells, which was really too small a contrast, um, and um, especially because our ear has the ability to detect minute changes in sound level. So we needed to, to make it bigger than 
a range of 14 bells and um, so then the decibel was introduced which is um, a, a decibel is a tenth of a bell. Um, the difference between the loudest and faintest sounds that normally hearing humans can hear is about 120 decibels which is a range of one million in loudness. Now this means we can hear a difference in loudness when the sound is altered by approximately one decibel. By recording the decibel level we are measuring the sound pressure, sound pressure level, which in logarithmic terms is power proportional to, to pressure squared. So sometimes you will see the decibel rating written as or expressed as dBSPL, de decibel sound pressure level. You may also see it expressed as dBHL or decibel hearing level. The hearing level is slightly different and this represents decibels according to average normal hearing. Now we'll talk more about that in a minute. It is important to remember that the decibel is not a linear measurement, which means it's not additive. So for example, a volume of six decibels of noise will be perceived as twice as loud as zero decibel. Or think about another way, we've got if we've got two sounds on either side of our head, both of them are 60 decibels, so 60 decibels on the left, 60 decibels on the right, what we'll hear at our, at our ears is not 120 decibels, we'll hear 63 decibels. So decibels are not additive and they're expressing um, the, um, the sound pressure. On the audiogram we have our decibels going down the y-axis, um, going from softer sounds at the top where 0 or minus 10. Um, some audiometers will allow you to test at minus 10 and then as we go down the graph they get louder so the loudest sounds are at the bottom and that's where our decibels are placed on the audiogram. Now frequency is, is pitch. For, um, I said before that we have a waveform and um, um, and that's how we can um, have a look at the type of frequency that we're getting. And the speed of the vibration is related to the perception of pitch. So you've got the magnitude to how much pressure there is, and then we, which is our decibels, and then we've got the speed of the vibration. It will tell us the pitch. The faster the vibration, the higher the pitch. And that's fairly simple to remember. So frequencies are expressed in cycles per second or hertz, um, and one cycle per second equals 1 hertz. So if we've got one waveform in a second, we have 1 hertz. If we've got a thousand um, wave cycles occurring in one second, we've got 1000 hertz. Human hearing ranges from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. That's at birth and um, as soon as we uh, are born our hearing cells start to die off and when you get to um, young adulthood you know you might be hearing up to 10, 12, 15,000 hertz and that just keeps shrinking the older you get. In audiometry um, frequencies are separated into octave bands or octave intervals and these are, are 125 hertz, oh sorry that's 260, it should be 250 hertz, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz, 4000 hertz and 8000 hertz. We can also measure the inter-octave frequencies and they obviously fall in between the octaves and they're 750 hertz, 1500 hertz, 3000 hertz, 6000 hertz. Um, you're not always required to test those frequencies, um, it just depends on the type of testing you're doing and the hearing loss that's being presented. So the frequency occurs on the x-axis and we can see We've got 125 hertz here going all the way up to 8000 hertz and these are our inter-octave lines just in here. So we could that would be 750, 1500, 3000 and 6000 there and we, you know, we have them written at the top and the bottom. And so we've got low frequency at the left going to higher frequencies on the right hand side. Okay. Now I did. I, I've, a couple of times I've said normally hearing people or, or um, um, hearing level versus sound pressure level. So what does all that mean? 
the, the first, to, to understand that we need to look at what's called the audibility curve um, because the audiogram is actually representative of the audibility curve. So let's start with zero decibels hearing level. So if we're on the audiogram and we're at zero decibels, so we're at the top of the graph, now that does not indicate no sound, just like naught degrees Celsius does not mean no temperature. Hearing level, so HL, is indicative of an average of the softest sounds 100 otologically normal, otologically young, otologically normal young adults can hear over each of the frequencies. Every 10 years, the International Standards Organisation gathers 100 otologically normal hearing young adults together and tests their hearing. Now, the softest sound that we can hear at each frequency varies. Um, because the human ears hear some frequencies better than others. So the softest sound pressure level for each frequency is zeroed and referred to as zero decibels hearing level on the audiogram. So if we look here at the audibility curve, we can see that in the low frequencies, we actually don't, the sound has to be a lot louder before we hear it. And then we get to the, the mid frequency range and we're actually hearing a lot better there. And then it goes up again towards the high frequency end. So the threshold of audibility for the average normal hearing listener for pure tones varying, varies between 125 and 8,000 hertz. The audibility threshold is the sound level in dBSPL, so decibel sound pressure level. That's where we're measuring the softest sounds. This is this curve here, sound pressure level. And that's, the, um, that's, as I said before, that's how loud we've got to make the sound before the listener can barely detect the tone. And we can see that the graph is not flat, or sorry, the curve is not flat, and the ear is more sensitive to some frequencies than others. So let, you know, as I said, it's, we don't hear these sounds as well as we hear these sounds. And on the graph we can see that 125 hertz, um, we can hear, we hear at um, 45 decibels, at 250, it's 25.5 decibels. At 500 hertz, <coughs> excuse me, it's 11.5 decibels. 1,000, it's 7 decibels. 2,000, it's 9 decibels. 4,000, 9.5 decibels. And 8,000, 13 decibels. So again, the ear is more sensitive in a range of mid frequencies between about 100 and 4,000 hertz than it is at the lower and higher frequencies. The complex shape of this curve provides the underlying motivation for the dB hearing level scale. So what they've done is they've measured um, healthy hearing young adults, seen the softer sounds they can hear, they've got that curve, they pull that curve flat or straight and that's what we get as zero decibel hearing level on the audiogram. Now we go on to the speech banana. And the speech banana is representative of um, where we're hearing sounds on the audiogram. So wh wh why do we test the frequencies shown on the audiogram? Why, why are we interested in, um, we don't really test at 125, but we test between 250 and 8,000 hertz. And in children, we're very interested between 500 and 4,000 hertz. The reason we test these, these frequencies because they are the frequencies of speech and obviously they're the sounds that um, as humans we're more sensitive to so that's where our speech has evolved with those sounds and we want to know um, hearing loss means that you have a communication disability and we want to know what part of that communication is breaking down for you. So the speech banana is a um, a good education tool for your clients. You can point out to them um, if they've got a hearing loss in certain areas, what sounds they might be hearing. So the human ear can hear between 20 to 20,000 hertz, but it's most susceptible to the sounds from 250 to 8,000 hertz. And this is where the majority of our speech information falls, um, especially between 250 and 4,000 hertz. But what this indicates here is that if um, you can see that this is also showing how loud these um, the sounds have to be before we actually hear them. So even people with normal hearing, if you're presenting speech at 
not to 10 decibels, they're actually not going to hear these sounds because right now my voice is probably pitch um, is probably around 50 decibels. So if if I had to drop my voice very 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 soft to be just audible, no one would hear that whether they had normal hearing or not. So even normal hearing people need speech to be heard in this um, in this mild range, um, otherwise they can't detect it. So when the audiogram is showing a person's threshold of speech, sorry, threshold of pure tones, not not how they interpret speech. But what you can do is um, say to your client, um, you're not hearing the high frequency sounds very well. So you can see that if your hearing's down here, you're not going to be getting any of these sounds at all. Or if they've got a low frequency loss, and um, they're coming in around 40, 50 decibels, they might just be able to detect some of these sounds, but they won't be coming through clearly. So that's how you use the speech to banana to show your clients where the sounds are coming in or where their hearing loss will affect speech sounds. So now if we, we've, got, we've gotten onto the client's um, hearing test and we're going to um, start recording the results and we need to use um, some symbols to, to put on there. Some, some of the audiometric symbols are, are universal, but you may see some differing ones um, depending what, what your practice uses or what part of the world you're in. But um, the symbols for the right ear and the left ear are standard worldwide. You should always have a key um, next to your audiogram, somewhere showing what the symbols you've used mean. So anyone can pick it up and read it and know um, what all the marks on the audiogram represent. So for the right ear, no matter where you are, you will see a circle and for the left ear, you will see a cross. Um, sometimes you will see the right ear um, written, the, the circle is written with a red pen and the left ear written with a blue pen. Um, you don't have to do that, but um, Universally in um, audiometric or audiometry practice, uh, red means right and blue means left. Those two colours are the only ones used when denoting the right and the left ear. Right, bone conduction. Um, one you may you will see a lot of is a little um, um, triangular bracket. Uh, the right ear points to the left and the left ear points to the right. And the reason um, we have it that way, not the other way around, is if you're looking at a client, um, this will be their right ear and this will be their left ear. So that's why it seems um, a little bit different. OK, um, now sometimes when we're, when we're testing clients, if they've got a significant difference between the ear, sound can travel from one side of the ear to the, one side of the head to the other, and uh, we might get a big difference between um, the testing of the ears. And when that happens, we've got certain formulas that we have to use to keep the good ear busy while we try and actually work out what the bad ear is hearing. And if we've used these formulas and and used the testing technique called masking, we have to show that um, the threshold that has been achieved is actually one that's been achieved through masking. So basically what we do is we colour in our left and right symbols. So the right ear is coloured in and the and the sorry the circle's coloured in and the cross is coloured in. Sometimes we have to um, ma uh, mask our bone conduction and the bone conduction uh, mask symbol it still points the same way. So the right ear still points out to the left and the left ear still points out to the right and we just flatten it off and make it a square bracket. I probably should have said right at the beginning that we, we test with air and bone conduction so that's two different transducers just in case you haven't become aware of that. Air conduction is with headphones or insert earphones where we're testing the entire peripheral hearing system. Bone conduction um, ignores the outer and middle ear and just tests the inner ear and you do it by placing the little, a little black vibrator on the mastoid bone behind the ear. Um, so we have to denote how which piece of equipment we're actually using when we're doing the test. 
Some people are so hearing impaired that you actually can't get a response from them. And if that happens, you put a little arrow on the end of any of the symbols. Um, if it was bone conduction or air conduction, you would need to um, put a little arrow on the end of it. So here's an audiogram. It's got all our little symbols on it. We can see some circles for the right ear and they're drawn nicely in red and some crosses for the left ear. And you don't have to do this, but protocol is that um, the right ear results are joined when you're completed and you believe your audiogram are joined up with a straight or unbroken line and the left ear is joined with a broken or dashed line. So you only join up your noughts and, noughts and crosses if you believe your audiogram and you think the results you've gotten are true. We can also see here that this person has some unmasked and masked bone conduction results. And then the clinician would put all this information together and be able to tell what sort of um, hearing loss this person has. But we'll get on to that. So now we're at the point where we're looking at our noughts and crosses and brackets and putting everything together. And when we're reading the audiogram, we are looking at um, how bad or how severe the hearing loss is, the type of hearing loss the person has, and if it's symmetrical. If is it affecting both ears or one, or is it affecting the ears um, differently? You might have a hearing loss in both ears, but it'd be um, asymmetrical. So let's look at that in more detail now. So severity of hearing loss. Um, traditionally, it's broken up into certain levels, and we can see on this graph we've got uh, lots of different um, gradients, if you like. So this audiogram shows um, the purple coloured part at the top. If your knots and crosses fall tw 20 or above, you are classed as having hearing within normal limits. If your hearing is uh, 25, uh, if the knots and crosses fall between 25 and about 45, you have a mild hearing loss. Uh, from 45 to about 55, you're considered to have, or 55 to 60, you're considered to have a moderate hearing loss. In this yellow part here, we've got a moderately severe hearing loss. 70 to 90 in the pink section is classed as a severe hearing loss, and anything greater than 90 decibels is classed as a profound hearing loss. The trick to remember is when you're trying to describe severities of loss severity of hearing loss, it's very rare that you'll get the noughts and crosses all fitting nicely in each section. So you might have to say the person has a mild to moderately severe hearing loss or a hearing within normal limits to 1000 hertz then drops off to a, um, a profound level in the high frequencies. So just remember that the, it's, it's very rare that you'll get all the noughts and crosses all falling in one section. So the other thing we're looking at is the type of loss or site of lesion. So where in the ear might the hearing loss be? The ear can be damaged in a number of places and where that damage occurs will impact on the audiometric presentation, which is great for us because if we're getting um, the knots and crosses appearing in a certain pattern, it gives us a lot of clues as to um, where the hearing loss is. Um, no two people have the exact same hearing loss with the exact same um, case history, so you've got to use all the information at hand to, to try and figure out um, where what's actually going on in the ear. You'll come across three terms when we're, when we're describing um, the type of hearing loss or the site of lesion. Those terms are conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, or mixed hearing loss. Now, if you've got um, if the site of lesion of the hearing loss is the outer or middle ear, the person will be described as having a conductive hearing loss. If it's um, in the inner ear or retrocochlea, so beyond the cochlea, it's described as a sensory neural hearing loss. If the client has both conductive and sensory neural components of of the hearing loss, um, it's called a mixed hearing loss. So that means that they will have damage in in the outer or middle ear and will have some damage in the inner or beyond the cochlea. And those two components go together and it's called a mixed hearing loss. Let's have a look at this uh, uh, diagrammatically. We can see we've got a, a picture of a human ear here. Here's our pinna, here's our ear canal, here's our eardrum or tympanic membrane and then our middle ear with the ossicles and the eustachian tube. So 
outer ear from the pinna to the tympanic membrane, middle ear from the tympanic membrane to the oval window. Um, sorry, that's your middle ear from the tympanic membrane to the oval window, and then from the oval window up to the auditory nerve is the inner ear. And we can see here that anywhere in this section up to the oval window, so from the pinna to the oval window, if you've got a loss in there or a problem in there, you're going to have a conductive hearing loss. From the oval window up to the auditory nerve, any problem in there is going to be this, a sensory neural hearing loss. And if you've got a problem here and here, you're going to get a mixed hearing loss. Let's have a look at some audiograms now. And on this first one, we've got um, air conduction results only. So we only have headphones on or insert earphones and we've got um, the circles are the right ear and the crosses are the left ear. When we only have air conduction, the information we can gather is how bad or how severe the hearing loss is, but we cannot tell where the site of lesion is. Because we've tested the whole hearing system, we know there's a problem, but we haven't been able to break it down to find out where that problem is. So this person would have a mild to moderately severe hearing loss. That's all I can say. But if we add our bone conduction results with it, so we've got our little bracket sitting on there, we can tell how severe it is, mild to moderately severe, and we can tell the site of lesion. Where the bone conduction results sit in relation to the air conduction results will give me information on where the hearing loss is in the ear. And I, I will get to that in a minute, but I know that this one is a sensory neural hearing loss because, that the, because the bone conduction results are sitting with the air conduction results, but I will go into that in more detail. So let's have a look at some different severities of hearing loss and where they sit on the audiogram. Hearing within normal limits, all the symbols are equal to or above the 20 decibel line. So remember I said it's an inverted graph, so the better you're hearing, the closer it is to the top of the graph. These guys are all sitting, you know, close to the top, so we've got hearing within normal limits across all the frequencies. I know I said that not, it's not often that you'll find all the knots and crosses falling within the same region, but with normal hearing, that's when you, that's when you get it the most. All right, a mild hearing loss. We've got some um, uh, some little bits still falling within the normal range, but we as we go down, we the furthest we go down is to 45, um, and both the left and the right ear are sitting together. So I've got a mild hearing loss. I don't say normal in the low frequencies and then getting mild. We just call that a mild hearing loss because overall it's mild. When you're, when you're describing a hearing loss, and you'll get more practices of this as you go on, but just to give you a, a bit of a pointer, we are m most concerned about what's happening between 400, sorry, 500 hertz and 4000 hertz because this is where all the main speech information falls. So always look to describe your audiogram between 500 and 4000 hertz. Moderate loss, and you can see we're moving further down. Um, you know, we even move into the moderately severe area here, and we've still got some normal hearing here. But overall, this would be described as a as a, mo a moderate hearing loss. And we move further down down the graph, and we're seeing um, a severe hearing loss, and then a profound one. We can see everything for this person is below is 90 or below. And we can even see we've got some little arrows here. So we that means remember no response was heard from the, the left ear because it's blue and attached to the cross. And because I didn't get a response here, I actually can't join up those noughts and crosses because um, I don't know what they heard. And because that, that arrow must be, it's probably depicting the right ear as well because it's not joined up. So we know that the, these knots and crosses are believed and these ones we're not sure what the actual threshold is there. Now sensory neural, when we talked about different um, different uh, sites of lesions and how the air and bone conduction results together can give us information as to what type of hearing loss. With a sensory neural hearing loss, the air conduction, so the crosses and the circles, and the bone conduction, so the brackets, sit together so they're 
pretty much following the same pattern, but they are below the normal range. So we know that air conduction tests the peripheral hearing mechanism, so, so from the outer ear all the way up to the acoustic nerve. The bone conductor, because it sits behind the ear on the mastoid, it is sending the sound directly into the inner ear, so it's bypassing the middle ear and the outer ear. But it's got a problem because it's bad, it's not normal. So that tells me that um, there is no problem in the middle ear, that the hearing loss is in the inner ear because the bone conduction or the inner ear part is not functioning as well as or the air conduction is not functioning. So the hearing loss is in the inner ear. A conductive hearing loss, however, we can see we've got our nice masked bone conduction results up the top because we've got our square brackets and they're sitting at 20 or above, so that's within the normal range. So for a conductive hearing loss, our bone conduction results will be normal. Okay, I've, I've, I've done my air conduction results first and they're below normal. Put the bone conductor on and the bone conductor is normal. Okay, so if I know my cochlea and inner ear is, is all working correctly, because I'm getting a normal result, but I'm getting a hearing loss, so that means that the hearing loss will be in, e in either the outer or the middle ear. Something's still stopping the sound from getting into the inner ear, but if we can bypass the outer and middle ear, we get normal results. So this gap between the bone conduction and the air conduction is called an air bone gap, and when you see an air bone gap, you have a conductive component in your hearing loss. Normal bone conduction, abnormal air conduction equals a conductive hearing loss. So then what's a mixed loss? Remember I said earlier that a mixed loss will be, there will be damage in the conductive component of the ear and in the um, sensory neural component of the ear, so in the inner ear or beyond. So how we figure out if it's a mixed loss or not, an air bone gap is, is present and which tells us that there's a conductive component. The inner ear is, is functioning better than, the, than um, some part of the ear and it's obviously going to be the outer or the middle. But for it to be a mixed loss, the bone conduction results are abnormal. So there is something going on sensory neural because it's showing a mild sensory neural loss here because the bone conduction results are below normal. And so, so we have a sensory neural component and we've got an air bone gap so we have a conductive component. Now here's a trick to help you get your head around a mixed hearing loss. If you could remove the air bone gap, so in other words bring our air conduction results up to our bone conduction results, would you still have a hearing loss? So yes, in this case if all these guys moved up we would still have a hearing loss because our sensory neural component is still there. And if the answer is yes, then we have a mixed loss because we've got a conductive component that it just, let's pretend we can t get rid of it. If we get rid of it, we still haven't got normal hearing. We've still got a hearing loss because there's a sensory neural component. So always think about that. If you could improve the air conduction results, would there still be a hearing loss? Let's have a little look at, at symmetry now. So our, our hearing, uh, Sometimes our ears don't go deaf together. Generally they do, um, unless there's a disease in one ear and not the other, or there's, uh, the person's had some sort of incident where one is more affected than the other. And it's always a good idea to keep your eye out for asymmetrical hearing losses because we expect our ears to go deaf together, and if they don't, there could be a medical issue that needs investigating. So on our left hand side our audiogram here we can see our left and our right ear sit nicely together with our bone conduction. We have a symmetrical sensory neural hearing loss. Over here we can see our right ear, sorry our left ear starts in the normal range and drops down to, well we should really only describe it to 4000 but down to a moderate range. So I'd describe this as a mild to moderate hearing, um, sensory neural hearing loss in the left ear. And our right ear, we've got a flat, moderately severe hearing loss. Um, um, it's been, we've masked our bone conduction and it's sitting with our air conduction results. So this is a moderately severe sensory neural hearing loss in the right ear. 
So I'm using different words to describe the severity of loss. So I have an asymmetrical loss here. You can also have bilateral or unilateral hearing losses. So are both ears affected or is only one affected? And we can see here on the left, we've got another symmetrical hearing loss where both ears are affected. And we've got normal bone conduction and an ear bone gap. So we have a bilateral conductive loss, a mild bilateral conductive loss on this person. And over here, we've got the right ear sitting above 20 decibels. So it's a nice normal ear, but the left ear is a long way down. So hearing loss only in one ear, so we call it a unilateral hearing loss. And this would be described as hearing within normal limits in the right ear with a severe sensory neural hearing loss in the left ear. So to sum it all up, our audiogram will depict sound heard in terms of its loudness, decibels, and pitch, frequency. Our results are denoted by symbols showing the left and right ear for air conduction and bone conduction results. From the audiogram, we can learn about the severity of loss and the type of loss, so how bad it is and where in the ear the hearing loss occurs. And we can also make statements about the symmetry and which ear has been affected. So the audiogram, as you can see, gives us lots of information, but remember you don't use it on its own. You will always use it in conjunction, conjunction with your case history and any other tests that you do before you make definitive um, conclusions about the person's hearing. Next week's tutorial, we're going to be looking at the clinical appointment and giving an overview of it. We're going to look at the test protocol um, in a typical audiometric assessment appointment, so what tests we'll be going through. We'll also have a look at how we might instruct a client when doing the test and we're going to have a look at how we might place headphones and insert earphones before we start the hearing test. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and um, that you tune in next time. Thanks for listening.